Everything started on, on, on the 3rd of October 1752, when Johannes Dietlis left the shores of North Germany. He was on his way to Batavia, Indonesia today, and um, four and a half months later near Cape Town, they put him ashore. As the story goes, he was apparently a very difficult guy. Uh, you won't believe it looking at me today. But that's how we started in South Africa. And then they, he went to Tolbach and Swellendam, uh, the next generations, and eventually ended up and we've started on the farm in 1822. Dietlis is today the second oldest wine estate in South Africa under ownership of the same family. So in four and a, and a half years time, we'll have our 200 year anniversary. Each generation contributed in, in their own way uh, to the storyline. In 1965, the farm won the prize for the most innovative farming practices. Um, 2000 Business of the Year of Mutual in the Western Cape. 2006-07, the top wine estate at SAA. And then in 2011, when Lufthansa launched their A380, the naming ceremony, um, for the VIP flight, only Dieter's wines were selected on board. I was born and bred uh, in Rosenwald, small town of Rosenwald, one hour from Cape Town, and I also went to school there. There was a headmaster, Caster Blanche, who had a major influence on my life. He taught me, I'm competitive by nature, but he taught me that you have to compete with yourself, not other people. Set your own goals. And that made a vast, vast difference in, in my life. Thinking back, uh, whilst at school, my father tried to talk me out of the wine business. And we had, again, this huge debate. And then he said it, and I've said to him, this is, this is my life, this is what I would like to do, this is my passion. And then he said, he accepted, he said that his only feeling was that he don't want me to follow in his footsteps because uh, I was linked to the farm, born there, and um, it must be, it's my future. I think it was a great relief for him and for me. Uh, I went to the University of Stellenbosch afterwards. I studied um, wine and, and viticulture, did my honours in, in viticulture. So everything was production focused, not business focused per se. At Varsity, um, I think if there's one thing that I've learned, is it the fact that you mustn't just study to graduate, you must prepare yourself for life. Whilst at Varsity, uh, we went to listen to uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, that was not the proper thing in those days, but he made a huge impression on me. And um, if you look at, you must do something right. And irrespective of the government of the day, his message today is still the same. And that really impressed me. I have the advantage uh, of meeting also at Varsity Hannes Vulcan, one of the most brilliant business minds in South Africa, according to me. Uh, always challenging the norm and never forget the person. Uh, I use him as a soundboard still today and to get outside perspectives because it's, I think it's very important. You can very easily, especially in our industry, get stable blind. After university I went to um, the army. Now again it's how you look at things. Um, you can, some people are negative, some positive. When we did some altitude climbing and did five peaks in the Himalayas, one of the Sherpas said to me uh, one day, you look uh, through a positive eye. I've said to him, no, with a positive eye. He said, no, through. And we had this debate. And then he said, if you look through a positive eye, it's the whole attitude from the inside. And that stuck with me somehow. Now, in the army, you've learned to be led during the basic phase, and you've learned to lead. Also, I was in intelligence and still principles we've learned there is applicable in the business today. If you safeguard a house, for example, some people just put in an alarm system and burglar bars. But you must assess the vulnerabilities before you take action. And it's the same thing in business. I started in 1988 on the farm working together with my father. We were very close. I was uh, the only son. And then um, in 1992, he passed away. It came as a big shock, but I've also realized he really prepared me for that day. He always said, when I hand over the bat and don't look back. And um, I've re actually realized it a couple of years afterwards. 
No, he was the person who made the biggest, who had the biggest impact on my life. And it's all about respect for people, and he had a wisdom in, in him. And um, I think the, uh, that laid the foundation also for the next steps I took. So in 92, after he passed away, I had two choices. Um, we can go for economy of scale business model or add value. In my mind, there was only one, one route. If you want to grow sustainably, you have to add value. So we've started to, to invest according to a 10-year plan in four phases. At that stage, there were only white cultivars on the farm, five white cultivars. So we've replanted all the cultivars. That was the first stage. Secondly was to get the right team and uh, upgrade the infrastructure. Thirdly was to find the right markets. And fourth was um, to utilize opportunities that arises from, from that. The markets at that stage was basically mainly Bach and a small um, focused part of wines that we've bottled but uh, not significant volumes. In 97, I went abroad the first time to look for markets, uh, asked for advice, and the only advice I got was, I must decide whether it's going to be inside the M25 or outside the M25 uh, in London. That's the only advice I got, and it wasn't a big help. In 1998, we started the first exports, um, and we had a huge start. We started with 11 containers, which is very good. And two years later, I became an importer. So some of the wines went off. It was bottled by independent company and was oxidized during the bottling. Uh, we didn't realize it. And so we had to import uh, nine of the 11 containers, which was a huge blow and lost the market. So it was starting all over again. We basically learned two lessons during that phase. The one was, just one step back to a 10-year plan. We were so focused on the plan that we, we forgot the next steps. So we've realized you have continuously rolled that forward. The other one was basically that um, you tend to look for sixes and fours in business. And if you think about cricket, it's the singles, well-placed singles that build the innings. So we've changed our focus in that sense. So we'd rather start smaller in the market than invest in hope. There were things born from the setback. So we've decided to take full control. So we've uh, established our own laboratory. It's a separate company in the group today, uh, doing work for other wineries, agents, importers. Um, the lab has been six out of eight times number one in South Africa, out of 52 wine laboratories. We've also started our own bottling company in 2003, and also doing work for other wineries and agents. So it's all about control in the end and doing the basics right. People often ask what drives me, it's growth. And it's not only monetary growth, it's growth of people, it's growth of business. It's always about the complete picture, back to that 5,000 piece puzzle. There's a couple of things we do different in the business. Uh, the way we structure it. My kids, for example, don't have a job guaranteed there. They must go the, and make it in the outside world. We've seen too many times um, children and family business coming back into the business, not necessarily the best for the job. We've made our biggest mistakes in hiring people, getting the right team together. Uh, we've listened to peep, uh, psychiatrists and the profile analysis, the whole story. Lately, people don't impress me by doing their job properly. They impress me when they take initiative. So in our interviews, we look for that. People who can take initiative. Technical knowledge is a given. And then, very important, can that person fit into our team culture? People make the difference. The right people. I think in the book, Good to Great, uh, they put it in, in, in a very proper way. If they say you must lead people, guide people, teach people. The moment you have to tightly manage people, you have the wrong people on board. So we went through the whole rigmarole of, of profile analysis and personality A will work well with you and, and we don't do that anymore. You, we listen to our gut feel and then we, the last question we ask around the table is can this specific person stand around a barbecue with a glass of wine together with the rest of the team? And then it's a yes or a no. Technical knowledge is a given. 
Um, people don't impress me by doing their job. They impress me by taking initiative. I think you must play people according to their strengths. And um, I've challenged my staff a while ago on training. And, um, for, and they said, no, everything is in place, induction training, safe health and safety. In the end, in my mind, that is not training. And as a team, we've decided going forward just how you mentor somebody, how you take him or her to a next level, create opportunities. If you don't expose yourself, you will never grow. There's another thing in terms of sustainability, how we decide to do business with a, a company or somebody. There's basically four criteria. People who share our values. People who have a hunger for growth. It must be profitable for everybody in the chain. And in the end, the end consumer must get value for money, irrespective of the price point. We have three wine ranges. Um, the family range, which is classic, they're clearly defined, and that's very important. And then the estate range, that is um, mouthful and elegance. And then the stone cross range, that is freshness and fruit. We get an outside panel in, we taste our own wine blinds in price brackets against other products. Because in our industry, you can easily get stable blind. You think your kids are the most beautiful. I think the industry complicates wine too much for people out there. In the end, it's a personal choice and it's enjoyment. People must be comfortable with the style. So we have clear guidelines on the style of the various ranges. We allow our winemaker to experiment. He must experiment. He must push boundaries all the time. And um, as long as it is within that, those parameters. Also in terms of winemaking, we tend to break the rules on that ex experimental side. So for example, we have the only white MCC made from Pinotage grapes in the world is from Dietlifs. And uh, in our voyage, 3566.1, that is named after the ship or the voyage number of the ship who brought the first Dietlifs. It's a Viennese Shannon and a semi blend. But again, we've hyperoxidized uh, the Viennese, and that's not the norm, with excellent results. On that specific voyage, it, uh, it done very well at Cape Wine Auction. Uh, our family white, which is a semi uh, won the trophy for the best semi in South Africa from Old Mutual, and got 92 out of 100 from one of uh, the most influential wine writers in the world, Tim Atkins. We have an interesting uh, business structure above the line, below the line. Above the line is the family interest and below the line is the business interest. So my kids know they're not a job guaranteed below the line. They must go out and make in the outside world. Back to the culture of a business. I think where a lot of business make a mistake, they have structures in place, especially in family businesses. They have structures in place, but the people involved in the business and the kids don't understand it properly. They must be able to tell that story better than you. Then below the line, we have three pillars. One is the wine section, which is our, our core business, the wine estate, the bottling company, and the laboratory. Pillar number two is the luxury goods market, and that's an interesting story. And then pillar number three, joint ventures. The whole luxury idea of luxury segment of the market uh, originated from a 1974 Muscat. It was a good-natured rivalry between my father and another winemaker, Albert Carstens. And he said, you can't keep a fortified wine for too long. And my dad said, you can, you must just leave it on the lease. So they closed down a small tank with more than a third of lease, the settlement, and the fortified wine. And in 1989, I was winemaker there. And I said to him, we must get rid of that old wine. I needed the space. And he said, fine, but let's have a look. I remember it clearly. And to make a long story short, he passed away in 92. In 2003, that wine won Gold's Musca de Monda in France. It reached the highest price ever at an auction in Rome, that same year of 3,130 euros for half bottle. I then got affidavits from the people who were involved in this wager and had it certified with a wine and spirit board. So we basically have got third party evidence on the story, the price and the quality. And then we've started to sell it. Uh, we've sold the first bottles of 150 Rand, 550, 1,200, and then I've realized we really have something special. And I've stopped it. Because there's so much wine linked to that specific batch. And in 2004, the price went up. The last two bottles were sold in, 
in, Tuka, in Cape Town for 32,000 rand a half bottle. We then withdrew it from the market and then about two years ago we've slowly started to release it in the right segments. So it was released in Lausanne, Switzerland at the Gala Dinner of Leading Hotels of the World. And now we're going into the next phase in terms of the luxury goods market. I've named the wine after my father and then we've decided to make one batch every 25 years. So the next release is in 2028 and then 2053 and so on. There's interesting development on the luxury side. For our anniversary in, in, in four and a half years time, we've decided to release 1,822 bottles, that's the year we've started, of Armagnac. We can only release it once, it will never be released again. Armagnac is a, is a distilled product. It is um, the only column still in the southern hemisphere is at Antoni Rupert Wines. And Johan Rupert said that they will do this distilling for us because it's such a unique happening. This wine will be positioned in the upper segment of the luxury market. And again, similar than the Muscat story, I can't tell the outcome as we sit here. In the long run, I firmly believe the luxury segment of the market will create an umbrella effect for the rest of the brands. In the end, we're selling a brand, we're not selling wine. And it's about the whole experience. And the experience can, is in the quality, it's in the service levels, and it's about the whole brand experience. So we've achieved our goals in terms of the international market. We're still growing on that side. But we've realized that if we really want to build the brand, the Dieter's brand strongly, we need to focus and get a good, strong foothold in the, in the local market. So about two and a half years ago, we've, we've slightly shifted emphasis there. And uh, the wines are distributed from the farm. We work, focus a lot on strategic networks with corporate companies um, and also then private individuals to distribute the brand um, locally. At Dieters, we don't have a bistro model. We don't have a restaurant. We focus 100% on wines. So people who visit us will experience, have a unique experience in terms of wines. Not only tasting different cultivars, but combinations, um, comparing different styles of wine. So it's a fun experience. It's fun and it is informative. I think the great thing about the road I chose in 1992 is the exposure. Exposure to different international cultures, businessmen, uh, business approaches. And um, we've learned a lot of lessons. We've made mistakes. Uh, I think what I've learned is how to, you must communicate your expectations. And that's the internal thing also in your business. Because you do something in a certain way and then you assume somebody else is, is going to have the similar approach. And that can create a lot of frustrations. So clearly communicate your expectations. That's the one. And the other one is that problems never go away. They just don't disappear. You have to address them immediately. I think another lesson that I've learned is that sometimes when there's challenges ahead, you focus so much on the next step that you forget where you're, where you're heading. So back to altitude climbing, you, you, it goes step by step, but in the end you must never lose sight of the peak. I think the, the wine industry is, is quite a unique industry. If you have three boutiques in one town and one goes down, the other two will take the market share. In the one is, is like one big dam. So if somebody goes down, somebody else with a dream comes in and buy that piece. So it just shifts around. So you must actually go out there and take a slice of the cake. Mentorship is really very important in the business career. And it's how you look at it. It's people who cross your path. And, but you must be open for it. Look and see, listen and hear. People who have made a difference in my life is like Mr. Enderze, uh, Steve de Blanche in Africa. It's um, Johannes Kiedelen in Germany, Jacques Thijs in Holland. I've learned from them, it's all about your own destiny. It's how you communicate a brand. It's about creativity and how you run your business. If you really want to grow your business in a sustainable way, you must adapt. I had to make some changes myself. Um, by nature, I'm a production guy. But in order to grow, I have to shift my emphasis to strategic networks with uh, businesses 
and um, also you have to hand over this baby that you've grown to other people. It's not that easy always.